Welcome to Heartland Vineyard's Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. To learn more about the vineyard, visit us at hvchurch.org. Hey, well, good morning. Kind of like Michael said a while ago, hey, you know, it's middle of February and it's not minus anything outside. Yeah, that's worth celebrating, right? Well, hey, uh, good morning. My name is Rodney. For those that don't know me, and I'm part of the Heartland Vineyard teaching team. And this morning, I'm going to go ahead and jump in because I got a lot of stuff I want to talk about this morning. Uh, but I want to tell you about a conversation I had with a friend a couple of years ago. A friend asked me a couple of years ago, do you believe everything that's in the Bible? And, of course, my response was, yeah, of course I do. And he looked at me and said, do you really believe? And I went, well, well yeah, I, I really believe. And, and I said, well, don't, don't you? And he goes, No. And that took me back for a second because the person I was talking to was a pastor. And I was like, what, what do you mean you don't believe? And he says, well, I do, but I don't. And I'm like, okay, hang on. You, you can't believe and not believe. You're kind of confusing me here. And he was really honest in his answer. He said, you know what? I believe in my heart that everything in that Bible is true. I believe it's God's word. But he says, I have a hard time living that out. And I thought about that for a second. And he said, you know what? As Christians, if we truly believed every single word that was in that Bible, we would be the happiest people on the face of the earth. We'd be a lot less stressed out, have a lot less anxiety and worry and fear, and our attitude would be better most of the time, I think. And, you know, when he said that, I thought, you know, it, that, he's, that, that is true. You know, because the Bible says that we confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart, but we live it out out of our mind the way we think. We really do. And so this morning, I get to kick off a new series this morning. It's called Transformed. And uh, I, I'm transformed and I've changed my mind. And, you know, the thesis verse for this series is a verse that you know probably pretty well. It's Romans 12, 2. And in Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So that's kind of our thesis verse for this series. And, you know, before we get too far, there's two key words in there I think we need to kind of look at. The first one is the word conform, and the Greek for, word for that is hopefully up on the screen, but I'm not even going to try to pronounce that one, but that is where we get the word schematic from, and if you know what a schematic is, it's basically a picture or a drawing, and so what Paul's saying there is that we should not be a picture of what the world looks like. In other words, we should not reflect or we should not mirror the world's ideas, their values, the way the world works. Instead, we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So the second word there is transformed. And this one I can actually pronounce. The Greek word for that one is metamorpho, and that's where we get the word metamorphosis from. And metamorphosis is real simple. It's a process in which someone or something is completely changed into something else. That's why if you looked at the title screen up there a while ago, we had a picture of a butterfly up there. According to the Bible, we have been transformed. The Bible says that we have a new heart and we have a new spirit. It says that we died with Christ and we were risen with him, a new creation. And we used to be a caterpillar. Now we're a butterfly. We are. But here's the problem. We cannot reflect that truth, and we will not look any different than the rest of the world will unless we renew our minds. We have to change the way that we think sometimes. You know, once we're in Christ Jesus, the battle is not for our hearts, not for our soul, not for our spirit. Jesus says, I have them in my hand, and no one can take them from me. Nobody. So we are secure in that part of it. We're secure in his love. The battle is for our mind right now. It's for the way we think. And, you know, if the enemy cannot have us, he'll do everything he can to ruin our day and render us ineffective as Christians. You know, we are kingdom people, and we are kingdom movers. That is our identity. That's our destiny. And I believe, like that verse says, I believe that is God's good and perfect and pleasing will for each one of us. So for the next few weeks, what you're going to hear is you're going to hear some teaching about being transformed and, and by renewing our mind. And you're going to hear things about renewing our mind about anxiety and worry and stress and insecurities. And, of course, today you're going to hear about attitude. So let's pray. Lord, I, I just go back and think of that verse. It says that we, you, you have us in your hand and nobody, no one. No one can take, you, take us from you. And so, Lord, I thank you for just that knowledge and, and just that, that understanding because that, that just relieves so many fears and worry and stress just knowing that we are secure in your love. And we just thank you for that. 
And Lord, uh, just this morning, you know, the battle is for our mind, the way we think. And so, Lord, right now, I would just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just rise up in each one of us, that you would start to change the way we think about things so that we could mirror you the way that, you know, that you have called us to do. That when the world looks at us, they don't see us, they see you. And their lives are changed because of that. So this morning, Lord, just use my words. Let, let them be your words, Lord. And let them, let, let them just change us from the inside out. Lord, we thank you. We, we just honor you this morning. We give you glory because you are so worthy. You are so beautiful. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, amen. Well, this morning, I'm officially going to kick off this series right now with I changed my mind about my attitude. And I want to start off with, I think it's hopefully it's a rhetorical question, but has anybody in here ever had a bad attitude? <laughs> All right. Here's the follow-up question. Did you know it or did someone have to tell you? Well, you know, last time I was up here about a month ago, I told you God keeps making me teach things that I have to work on. And it's getting kind of annoying. And, you know, as soon as I thought that, I thought, oh, my gosh, Rodney, that's a bad attitude. <laughs> but it's true. It, it is true. And so about a month ago, when I sat down and first started thinking about this, my wife asked me, she says, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to teach next. And she says, what's your topic? And I went, well, it's I changed my mind about my attitude. And she smirked a little bit and said, I think I can help you with that. <laughs> that's what she did. And let me give you a little follow-up. About two weeks later, I asked her, I said, well, you know, has my attitude changed? And she went, yeah, I think so. I said, really, it's changed? She goes, yeah, you're a lot less whiny and pouty than you used to be. <laughs> Again, not what you necessarily want to hear from your wife, right? And, and I could have had a bad attitude about that, but I was thinking progress. I'm making progress. Lord's working here. So know this morning, I, I tell you that for a reason. Everything I'm going to say to you this morning, I, I'm saying to myself also, because the Lord's really been working on me for like the last month or so as I've been preparing this. So to start off with, I want to establish just a couple things right off the bat. First of all, I want to define what attitude is. And then I also want to kind of establish where we think, where we think our attitudes originate from. So definition first. This is according to Oxford Dictionary. An attitude is a feeling or a way of thinking that affects a person's behavior. So it's the way we feel or the way we think, and it will affect our behavior. And, you know, there are all kinds of attitudes that we can choose. And, and I'm using that word choose on purpose because our attitude actually is a choice. Y'all know that, right? We get to actually choose our attitude. And this list that you're going to see up here is by no means an exhaustive list. There's all kinds of different attitudes you can have. But I chose these on purpose because I figured these were ones that people could probably identify with. And these are also ones that I've kind of wrestled with, struggled with a little bit in my own life. But we get to choose to be positive or negative, content or discontented, cynical or hopeful, thankful or ungrateful, merciful or unforgiving, can't. Uh, can do or can't, humble or proud, victorious or victim, encouraging or discouraging. We get to choose those things. We get to choose which one of those things we want to be. And not only do we get to choose, it's actually our responsibility to choose because if we don't choose them, it will be chosen for us. It will. So that, that takes us to this next kind of question. Where, where do we believe that our attitude comes from? Where does it originate from? And, you know, the two most common, two most common I think really the only two answers to this is actually something or someone. In other words, a lot of times we feel like our attitude either comes from our problems or circumstances, or they come from people, one or the other. Well, let's look at our problems first. Nobody here has a perfect life, right? If you do, I want to know, I, you need to tell me about this, come see me. But we all have problems and circumstances in our life, you agree? And you know, we have a choice how we let those problems or circumstances affect our attitude. We do have a choice. Let me give you some examples. Can't sleep, been here before, because you're cynical. Think about the person who is homeless, that doesn't have a bed to lay in. Defeated because your car won't start. You know less than 20% of the world even has access to a car? We're rich people, very rich people. Negative because you had a bad day at work. Oh, boy. <laughs> Think about the person who's been out of work for three months, doesn't even have a job. Discontented because you didn't get the raise or you didn't get the promotion that you wanted at work. Think about the person in a third world country that's working 12 hours a day, seven days a week for $10 a week, just trying to put food on the table for their family. Discouraged because you don't know what your life's calling is. Think about the person who didn't ever live long enough to even understand or think about what their life's calling is even going to be. You know, 
we all have issues, we all have circumstances, we all have problems that happen in our lives. Things happen. They just do. But see, here, here's the thing we got to understand. Our problem is usually not our problem. Our problem is our attitude about our problem. Now, I'm going to repeat that because that was a lot of problems in there. Our problem is usually not the problem. Our problem is our attitude about our problem. Another way of thinking about it is how we perceive or how we think about our problem is usually the problem. Now, I'm not saying we should be happy when our car doesn't start. I wouldn't be happy either. And I'm not saying you should not be disappointed if you don't get a raise. I would be disappointed in that also. It's okay to have emotions about things that happen in our lives. It's okay. It's healthy to have emotions. What can't happen, though, is we can't let those temporary things and those temporary emotions affect our attitude, especially the way we react or the way we act around other people. You know, if we go back to the definition for attitude, I, I didn't really talk about those last four or five words, but it says a feeling or way of thinking that affects a person's behavior. Attitude affects our behavior. It really does. And, you know, we have to deal with our attitudes as emotions before they turn into a negative behavior because sooner or later, whether we want it to or not, whatever is going on on the inside is going to show up on the outside. It's going to. There's no way around that. I'll tell you a story about probably eight years ago now. And I think I've told this story up here before, but things really started changing at school. I'm, I am a teacher, for those that don't know that. And things started changing, and it wasn't good. And I was struggling with it pretty, pretty hard. And there was a lot of people that were struggling. I had some people I taught with for years that retired or, or moved to a different school. And uh, I, I knew my attitude was bad. I just didn't know how bad. I, until one day my wife said to me, she says, I'm going to email your administrator. And, and that stopped me dead in my tracks. I went, do, do what? What did you say? And she goes, I'm going to email your administrator. I was like, why would you do that? And she says, because your schoolwork is actually affecting you in a, in a negative way. And it's changing your entire personality. And I don't like it. And that kind of stunned me there for a second. I mean, it really did, because I thought, oh, my gosh, I knew my attitude was bad. I just didn't know it was that bad. Well, you know, I, I could have chosen to do what a lot of other people did. I could have quit. I could have got a different job. But I chose to stay where I was at. And, you know, I, I can't change what happens at work. I, I can't. But what I can do is I can change the way I act toward those things. I can change my attitude. That I can do. You know, I don't know that work's gotten any better over the last seven or eight years. If anything, I'd probably say it got worse. But what has gotten better is my attitude. It has. You know, every day when I go to work and I'm praying, I always tell the Lord, I'm so thankful that I do have a job. I mean, I do. I have a job. There's people that don't have a job. I have a job, and I'm thankful for that. And I go to school every day with the expectation of having a Colossians 3.23 day. And if you don't know Colossians 3.23, you, you need to know that verse. This, this verse will help you at work. In Colossians 3.23, says, 3, it says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Try to go there every day with that. Because, see, my problem is not really my problem. My problem was my attitude about my problem. And that was what was getting in the way. If we don't blame our attitude on our problems, then we usually try to blame our attitude on people. I mean, you know people do stuff to to irritate you and to get on your nerve. You know that. I've seen that many times. Then people are about to get on my last nerve. It happens. Well, I, I found a post, and it should be up here, that uh, somebody posted on Facebook, and I reposted it because I thought, oh, my gosh. And I thought, first of all, I thought, this is funny, but I thought, oh, my gosh, this is probably way too true. Anybody here from the south side of the kingdom? <laughs> yeah? Y'all know there's no south side, right? Just the kingdom, that's it. No south side of that kingdom. Well, you know, when I thought about people causing us to have a bad attitude, the very first thing I thought of, the first thing the Lord put in my head was road rage. And I don't know why that one came up, but that's what, what he brought to my mind. And so I, I looked up some st uh, statistics on road rage. And these are actually fairly current. They're from October 2019, so I don't think you're getting much more current than this. And there was a bunch of them. I put some up there, but the one I really want you to focus on is the first one. It says that 82% of drivers in the U.S. admit to having road rage or driving aggressively at least one time in the past year. 82%. Now, here's another one. There's another poll that says 65% of Americans identify themselves as being Christians. That one kind of makes me sad because that number keeps going down every year. But let's do some simple math. 82% of the people claim to have road rage at least one time, right? Which means 18% don't. Now, we'll say those 18% are Christians. Don't know if they are or not. We'll just give that to them. 
All right, well, some simple math. If 65% of the people identify as being a Christian and 18% don't have road rage, if you subtract, you get 47%. That means 47% of Christians are admitting to having road rage at least one time a year, which means as Christians, we're allowing other people's behavior to affect our attitude. And I'm not judging here, trust me, because I'm probably part of that 47%. Uh, I, I can tell you this, uh, it was not yesterday or two days ago, Friday, Friday before last, me and my wife are going home from buying groceries and we're going down Stan Martin and I'm stuck behind two cars doing 30 miles an hour in a 45. And I might got a little bit close to the back of them. And all of a sudden it hit me, oh my gosh, I'm teaching about this stuff in a week. <laughs> so I backed off a little bit and I asked my wife, I said, do I have road rage? And she says, well, I don't know if you have road rage, but you got something. <laughs> and then she started telling me about how I was driving. And really, all, all I was looking for was a yes or no answer there. <laughs> but, yeah, she started telling me that. So, I mean, here's the deal. We, we could probably fix this by not driving. <laughs> right? But you know what? If it wasn't driving, it would be something else. This happened about a week ago. I was at hy V picking up stuff on sale. I had my three things. I went up to the express lane. Three things. And the guy in front of me has a basket. I'm not kidding. A basket with about 40 things in it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what's wrong with you? Can't you read? And immediately the Holy Spirit said, Rodney, what's wrong with you? And I went, oh, my gosh, I'm having a bad attitude. So the Lord's really been working on me through this uh, for the, really the last month. I mean, seriously. Now, my other thought was, well, we could avoid people. 7.7 <laughs> billion people on the face of the earth. Avoidance kind of hard, isn't it? But that's not the answer anyway. It's not. You know, we were made, first and foremost, to have a relationship with God the Father, and second, to have a relationship with each other. You know, people aren't a problem. We don't need a people solution. We don't. In Ephesians 6, 12, it says this. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, that's people. But it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. To me, that verse is very clear. People are not the problem. Sin and the enemy, that's the problem. You know, if we are in Christ Jesus, we've been set free from the power of sin. That stuff should not have any power in our life. And I started thinking about this. If anybody ever had a reason to have an attitude with people, it was Jesus. I mean, think about it. He had a reason to lash out and have a negative attitude, have road rage if he had a car. But he didn't do that. Jesus, he chose instead to humble himself and become a servant and to die on a cross for you and for me. That's what he chose to do instead. He could have had an attitude, but instead he chose to love us. And you know, really, that's the only thing that God's ever asked us to do. It says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, you love one another. They will know you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. That's all we've been called to do. You know, Paul understood this. He talked about this in his letter to the church of Philippi. And this is kind of a long passage. I'm not going to read it all. I'll just read the first few verses and kind of talk to you a little bit about the rest of it. But in Philippians 2, starting at verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. You know, that's what Jesus did. He didn't look out for his own interest. He looked out for the interest of you and of me. That's what he did. You know, Paul writes further. He says that Christ Jesus humbled himself even unto death on a cross. And, you know, the very last part of this passage that Paul writes, he says, at the name of Jesus, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, when we choose to have a bad attitude, and therefore we're going to end up with a bad behavior also, we're giving power to something that's already been defeated in our lives. That stuff has no power in our lives. See, our attitude is not caused by our problems, and it's not caused by people. Our attitude is caused when we allow the enemy access to our mind and let him alter the way that we think. So here's the question we have to ask ourselves. Do we think the way that the world thinks, or do we access Holy Spirit living inside of us and think the way that Jesus thinks? That's the question. That's what we have to try to figure out. So now we, we kind of know what our attitude is. 
and we kind of sort of know where we used to think our attitude originated from, right? I want to spend the last few minutes I have talking about a few truths about our attitude. And here's truth number one. Our attitudes are contagious. They are. You know, we're right in the middle of flu season. Flu is contagious. Well, our attitudes are the same way. Whether we have a good attitude or bad attitude, not only does it affect other people, it can be caught by other people. There's a great example of this found in, in Acts 16, and this is a long passage, so I'm going to kind of give you some context first. But in Acts 16, you have Paul and Silas. They're on a missionary journey, and they're going through a town. And as they go through this town, they run across this young slave woman, has an evil spirit inside of her that allows her to tell fortunes. And she follows Paul and Silas around for a few minutes or for a few days, and she keeps saying these things out loud until one day Paul's just irritated with her, and he turns around and says, come out of her, and the spirit leaves. Well, at that moment, the, the men who own her realize, okay, she can't tell fortunes anymore. And since she can't tell these fortunes, we're not going to make any money off this woman anymore. So they get angry. They take Paul and Silas and bring them to the authorities. And the authorities order that Paul and Silas be beaten and thrown in jail. So we're going to pick this up in verse 23. It says, after they, and this is Paul and Silas, had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. You know, there's a story about a good attitude that was contagious. I mean, think about this. Paul and Silas were thrown into prison for doing something good. They hadn't broken a law. They hadn't committed sin. They hadn't done anything wrong. They set a woman free from an evil spirit. And so they could have been, they could have had a bad negative attitude about their circumstances being thrown in jail. They could have been angry and had a bad attitude about the people who threw them in jail. But that's not what they chose to do. Said, instead, they chose to worship God. That's what they chose to do. And because they did that, their attitude was caught by not only the prisoners, but also the jailer. You know, it doesn't tell us a whole lot else about the prisoners. But it does say that they were listening as Paul and them were singing. And it says that when the doors flew open and the chains fell off, them other prisoners could have ran off and escaped, but they didn't do it. So that attitude was caught by those prisoners. And we know that attitude was caught by the jailer. Because that attitude was good, because it was con so contagious, we know a jailer and his entire family came to know the Lord. See, when we have a good attitude, when our attitude is good and it looks like Jesus and we reflect him well, it has power. It has power to change lives. You know, unfortunately, the opposite is also true. When our attitude is bad, it can also be caught. And it can also change lives, but not in a good way. You know, every day... I deal with about 125 teenagers, and they don't always have a good attitude. They don't. But one of the things I've kind of learned is that whether I really want the responsibility or not, I, I kind of set the tone and the atmosphere for my classroom. And I've kind of realized this, that if I have a good attitude, then most, not all of them, but most of my students will also have a good attitude. But if my attitude's bad, guess what? It ain't going to take long, and it's just chaos in there. And something I've kind of learned, I learned this a long time ago, kind of the hard way, but, you know, sometimes you have a bad period. It, it just happens. And uh, what, I, what I've kind of learned to do is when that next class comes in there, I just, I'm just honest with them. I go, look, guys, I'm not in a good mood right now. And I want you to know straight up front that I'm not in a good mood. It has nothing to do with you. If you just be patient with me, give me just a little bit of time, I will get over this. But I want to make sure I don't take things out on you. And I want you to understand that. And you'd be amazed how gracious teenagers can be. See, they understand. They get it because things happen in their lives also. And they are usually very, very, very gracious. They understand. See, we don't live in a bubble. We don't. Our attitude affects people, and our attitude is contagious. So truth number two, 
our attitude usually needs to be checked and adjusted on a regular basis. Hopefully there's a picture coming up. Anybody know what that is? That is actually called an attitude indicator. It is. You, you will find that in the cockpit of, uh, cockpit of the airplane. And what that does, it tells the pilot where they are flying in relationship with the Earth's horizon. So it tells them if they're li uh, flying level, and if they're not, to what degree they're off. That's what that thing is. Wouldn't it be nice to have an attitude indicator for our own attitudes? Wouldn't it be nice to know at a glance if your attitude's looking up, if it's looking down, if we're getting a little sideways with somebody? It would be, wouldn't it? Well, we do have an attitude attitude indicator, and no, it's not my wife. <laughs> Although, for a small nominal fee, she will help you out. I promise. <laughs> the attitude indicator we have is the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And, you know, if we will just listen to him, if we'll ask, and then we'll listen to him, he'll tell us when we're not reflecting Jesus well. I mean, he told me at the grocery store, you know, my first thought was, what's wrong with you? And then it was like, Rodney, what's wrong with you? You know, he, he will tell us when, we're, when our attitude is not good. You know, in John 16, it says this. It says that the Holy Spirit will convict us of our righteousness. So when we're acting outside of who we were called to be and who we were made to be, the Holy Spirit, if we'll ask and listen, he'll let us know. You know, when we're not the new creation that we were created to be, he'll, he'll tell us. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, and I'm going to close. But I still have one, less, one, one more thing that I need to talk about real quick, and that's how do we change our attitude? How do we do that? And as I thought about it, the answer was pretty simple. It's happy hour. <laughs> you know, there are bars and restaurants all over the place that have a happy hour every day about the time people get off work because they know when people get off work, they need their attitude adjusted. Now, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, promoting let's go to happy hour at a bar or someplace. The happy hour I'm talking about is the time that we spend with Jesus. You, you've heard me talk about this before. My happy hour, which is really only about 30 to 45 minutes, happens from about 5 to 5.45 every morning. And when I get up and spend that time worshiping, praying, reading, whatever it is I choose to do that day, my day goes a lot better, and I'm a lot happier. I really am. Things go better. I don't stress out about what the day is going to bring, and it's still a lot better. So when I spend time with my dad, my attitude is always better. And, you know, sometimes I miss a day. In fact, just recently I've missed two days because I had to go outside and shovel snow. And so that was kind of the days I didn't get to spend time with my dad. But when I don't, I can always tell. I can always tell because the day is just a little bit different. The other thing I think we can do, and, and I think this goes right along with our happy hour. And Paul talks about this in Philippians 4.8. In Philippians 4.8, Paul writes this. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, we can spend time dwelling on the negative things that happen in our life. We can spend time dwelling on those people who are driving 30 miles an hour in a 45. But it's so much better if we spend time dwelling on the things that Christ Jesus has done for us. When we do that, we think about him. It just changes everything. And I'm not sure that we can actually really think about him a whole lot if we haven't been spending time with the Father. So I think those kind of go hand in hand. But that's part of renewing our mind is thinking about him. So I want to close this with a quote by John Maxwell. John Maxwell says this. He says, attitude is the librarian of our past, the speaker of our present, and the prophet of our future. And, and I think those words are so true. I, I really do. So if you would, stand with me. Have the worship team up here. We're, we're going to worship here in just a minute. And this is why I would encourage you as we worship. You know, worship's more than just about singing a song and singing some words. Worship is about spending time with our Father. We can have happy hour, or at least happy five minutes, right here, right now. And if we will, if you will choose to do that, if you will choose right now to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, renew my mind right here, right now. As we sing this song, you'd be amazed at how eager he is to come and do that for us. So let me pray for us before we worship. So Father, right now, I just thank you that you are eager to come in and just change our attitude for us because you want the very, very best for each one of us. You love us. And Lord, you want us to live that abundant life that, that you so, so gave your life for. And so Lord, as we sing, you know, 
and we're not just going to sing words. We're going to sing with our hearts, Lord. And Lord, I would just ask as we do that, just renew our minds. Renew our minds to the things of you, the good, the lovely, the noble, the praiseworthy, because that's what you are, Lord. So we bless you as we worship. We thank you.